Uh, look, just to get us started, congratulations on, on 40 years of the, the Marshall Tucker Band. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, It has been uh, quite an unusual ride. It's all been good, and it's kind of hard to find a band these days that everything's been really good. We lost a few members, but uh, as, as you do in most uh, things that you do, you lose people, and you miss them, and you love them, you know, and you go on. That's true. J- just to go back to the beginning, can you tell us about the formation of the band and the, perhaps the blueprint you had in mind for the sound of the band when you first started? You know, it was pretty cool. All we really wanted was to buy beer for the weekend. <laughs> and uh, and that being a true story uh, makes it pretty simple. We were uh, we, we started out in junior high school, and then we went through high school, and we went to various different bands that, uh, you know, each person created, and then we all kind of meshed back together. We all stayed friends, and back in the old days, everybody knew every musician that was in town, and uh, regardless of what kind of music they played. But anyway, we were all friends together, and we hung out together after school, and m- music was our life. and. Uh, you know, we just rose, rose on from the Beatles all the way to Aretha Franklin. And, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to remember me singing Respect, but I actually did it in a show. And uh, it, was, it was pretty cool, and we gained a lot of attention. And then we all went away to service, and uh, a couple of us did. And uh, I went to Vietnam, Toy went to Vietnam, and then we came back, and we gave it a year. And we said, hey, look, we'll all go to work. And we, I worked at a bank. Toy uh, worked at plumbing with his father, and he has, has a nice business. And uh, uh, so we all decided that, uh, you know, this promoter come up. We rehearsed every day, Monday through Thursday, and played on the weekends. And then we said, all right, we've got to give it a shot. We recorded three songs. And then uh, a, year, a year or so later, we went on the road with the Allman Brothers. Wow. And that changed our life. Now, I'm sure this is a story you've told many times before, but it's a, it's a wonderful story about how the, the band got its name. And the, it belonged to a local piano tuner, I believe. He, w- he is a piano tuner. He's still alive. He's 96 years old. Wow. And he lives in Columbia, South Carolina. But he lived in Spartanburg, and he had rented the warehouse uh, right before we did, about a year or two. And uh, then he realized, and there was a bunch of old piano parts stored in there, but he was blind, and his wife is blind as well, and um, we needed a name for our band. It's the place we were rehearsing in, and it was a basement of old, there were hookers all in the hotel upstairs, and then we rented the basement with a separate entrance, I might add, and, uh, you know, I don't I don't know if anybody ever partook in, it, partake in anything that was going on upstairs, but... I'd probably not tell you if they did, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, it, it was all all in fun. And anyway, the promoter came down, and he says, I got a band I'd like for you to open for, and it's Jimmy Hall and Wet Willie Band. And that song was Keep On Smiling. And uh, I got to tell you, that was uh, it was monumental. We, we sit there, and on the key there was a, a tag, and on the tag, just like a rental car or a hotel, it had the name uh, Marshall Tucker on it. And so we told this promoter that wanted us to open for Jimmy Hall. And uh, we said, okay, we'll name it Marshall Tucker just for the weekend cause in lack of a better name. And here we are 40 years later. <laughs> and a little side note, I might say that Marshall Tucker has just finished uh, almost 50 years of taking care of the choir in his church, and he just retired from doing that. Uh, <clears throat> so that's pretty neat. What a great story. It's uh, very easy for people to categorize the, the band as a southern rock band, but I always felt you, you were much more than that. Were, were you comfortable being labeled in that southern rock genre? Uh, you know what? I always felt good. I still feel good today. It's kind of hard to take the southern out of this boy, okay? <laughs> um, it is It is truly uh, proud that we're from the south. My mom and dad both worked in a cotton mill, and, uh, you know, they they learned the road. They learned how to do it. I remember them coming back. But they gave it, gave me and the people around here a real backbone because we are, you know, we, we relied on each other. 
And uh, I got to tell you, being being a Southern band had a lot of advantages to it. Whereas a lot of uh, a lot of people have to go and go to work and go across the country and drive a truck. And we have you know we have truckers out there now that love Marshall Tucker Band, and they liked it because it was so much like them. When you got home, you were all about family, and uh, you never turned on your family. You never did this. Of course, now I've been married four times, but. Uh, I, I still take care of all of my kids. They all love me, and you know, Father's Day yesterday, they all call me. And even though I was on the road coming from Iowa, they know I'm happy that way. So, I mean, we have we have some really good likings of, uh, and still, I try to raise them with that kind of background, but where you got to take care of your family first, and everything else will fall into place. There seemed to be a real sense of community amongst uh, those bands that were the, the Southern rock bands. Was it? Was it? that how the way it was or was there a degree of competitiveness amongst you <laughs> no there wasn't any competition we kept all the secrets secrets to our to ourselves <laughs> uh, there was uh you know greg and myself still t- stay in touch today charlie and i talk uh, probably once or twice a week and uh, all of these guys dicky we get to see him and 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 go and hang out and uh, you know now it's a little bit cooler and a little bit easier when we hang out together, and uh, you know we get a chance just to go hide out at somebody's house instead of going to all the clubs we used to go clubbing at. But you know, forty years later, you're a bit older and a bit wiser, and it's easier to hang out at somebody's home than uh, you know driving down the road out of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> How important was it for you in those very early days to be with a, a record label like Capricorn, who also represented other bands that you would have seen as contemporaries of yours? Oh yeah, well, I got to tell you, we had groups with us. White Witch was a uh, a very far out, what we call far out for being a Southern band. But Phil Walden, the owner of, of Capricorn Records, was extremely smart in that way. He had us, the Holman Brothers. He had previously had and recorded Otis Reddy. And so there was a lot of history there that a lot of people ever, never even knew about. And we would go, and, and uh, I'd see, there was many times that I'd see uh, Matt Rabinac, Dr. John, sitting in the other rehearsal room over at the studio. And we would go in there, and I'd sit down with him beside the piano, and, and he'd take on the right place, but it must have been the wrong time, you know. Yeah. And I, I heard that so many times. I said, man, you're going to have to write another song. And now, today, that song still gets played everywhere, and he's out playing. Yeah, that's so, right. And Chuck LaBelle, you know, Chuck's still playing with the Stones every time they go out. And Chuck was with a group called Sea Level. He actually is on three of my uh, three of my uh, different records as studio musician. Talk about uh, Toy Cordwell. What a, what a great songwriting talent he was. Do, do you think he was a bit underappreciated by the, the music public in general outside of Marshall Tucker fans? Without a doubt. Uh, or I, There wouldn't be a Marshall Tucker existence today had not Toy had that ability to write songs that got close to people's heart. Uh, you put all those songs together and, and a lot of times it that I do it just for the fun of it, and I put the different song titles together, and it's like toyed right in my own way. I love you. Can't you see what that woman's been doing to me now? I'm searching for a rainbow, and I mean, I I, I do that on occasion. Just as I'm, you know, we're traveling down the road on the bus or in the car, and you know, I'm still gone over 225 days a year from home, and uh, the rest of the time's 100 percent home. So I get a lot of chances to write those kind of things down. Toy was extremely underrated, and uh, I think he just got passed by because there were so many additional great guitarists at that time. Mm. Of course, the, the song we best know the band for here in Australia is, is Can't You See? It's a, it's a timeless piece of music. Do you remember the first time you heard the playback of that song and your initial thoughts of it? Oh, boy, it was unbelievable. Uh, yeah, I still have one of the original tapes, and the original tape was uh, done in Muscle Shows, Alabama. Uh, in a lot of people, and I kind of this. You're like the third person I've ever told about this. We had a uh, we had a guy to take us down to uh, to buy some studio time in Muscle Shows, Alabama, where all the big horn players came from, and all the real real soulful stuff. Knock on wood, Eddie Floyd, and, Pete, and songs like that. And these and all the brothers had recorded there too, and uh, with Barry Beckett, the producer, 
And so we recorded Can't You See the first time, and Toy said, well, you know, I don't really have it finished, but by golly, I'm going to go in there, we're going to give it hell. And so we just put it in the form that Toy wanted to put it into, and, uh, you know, never thought about stopping. The reason that we stopped and did the hand clapping together in the song that's on the album cut is you'll hear Toy say, all right, come on now, put your hands together. It's because his string broke. Uh. And back in the old days... That's that's how all that started to get the audience, and we never realized that the audience would take up. And now today, since Toy is no longer singing that song, and I never liked that song. I didn't do that. You know, I sang ninety nine percent of all the Marshall Tucker stuff because Toy would say, "Okay, here's you another one. Tra- check this out," and I'd have to change the words around or whatever to make it to my liking. But Toy, I, he said, "Man," he said, "I want to do this." These are side notes, and and. I, I said, man, this is the one song that you can sing because you're screaming your heart out. And that's what he's doing in these song, uh, on his on this particular song. He is screaming his heart out. Can't you see what that woman's been doing? I mean, that's just the kind of guy he was, ex-Marine, big, tough guy, and, you know, with that little bitty skinny thumb that made him that guitar player that he was. Mm. Now, it was after uh, Tommy's tragic uh, death that you, you had to step forward and be a bit more of the front man. Was it a role you were comfortable to take on? No, I still am not comfortable with it today because I just soon stand back and sing my heart out, okay? Mm. But it is, it's, I, I tried one thing that is kind of funny. In a lot of different ways, it's funny. In a lot of ways, it's sad. Uh, I, I went and bought all these live records, and I said, now, you know, I know nothing about, I've been on the stage in front of thousands and thousands of people. And then I said, you know, I don't know anything. Toy looked at me and we talked just riding around in the car. He said, now you need to get up there and you need to say something and talk to the audience. I said, man. And so I went and bought all these live records and I listened to everything that they were saying. Well, for the first two gigs that we went out, one was in Houston, Texas at the Summit, a place over about 24,000 people. And we had our bass player friend who was a friend of mine in toys in, in uh, high school. And we had him out there replacing Tommy for the time being. And, uh, you know, we were all discovering what that was really going to feel like without Tommy because we knew it wasn't that way. And um, we got up there and we played that. And I got to tell you, some of the, some of the most memorable stuff come out of, of Toy being able to be that type of songwriter and that understanding of a person. And you know what? He, he, he always said it and as I stand up today and let the audience sing, can't you see? They know the first word to the last word. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the job of replacing Tommy in the band fell to Franklin Wilkie. Was there an extensive process involved in finding that replacement? Uh, with, with Franklin? With no, Franklin, there yeah. Was it. Yeah, with Franklin, no, there wasn't, because Franklin had been in different toy factories, and we called them toy factories because toy was the one that everybody wanted to play with, okay? And so we called it the toy factory because we were shuffling through different members of the band, and as we were going to Vietnam or coming back or being in the military, and uh, we had to track Jerry down. He was somewhere in California, and no, we... Uh, we as of today, it is still hard to replace Tommy Caldwell mm. to me. I go back in the studio, as as you probably know, I have like 4,000 live tapes. And we were one of the lucky ones that had big machines that we carried around with us just so that, you know, we felt as if something was up. So we wanted to record all of them. I've got DVDs that have yet to be mastered. But I go in the studio, and I put them on, and everybody, these engineers say, hey, we're digital now, man. We can change this or take that bad part out. And I almost want to hit him in the mouth, you know, s- simply because I don't want the, I want people to know who the band was. I want, I want them seriously to know. The bass, the bass part of those songs are a driving instinct. It was almost as if... Tommy and Toy, now t- the two brothers, of course, but the Tommy and Toy were, it was like they were never fighting each other. It was almost like they were complimenting each other over the top. And then George McCorkle, his rhythm guitar, it, it's extremely hard to replace people like that. I mean, not that we were, none of us, and honestly, I can say this, we were truly never experienced musicians. You know, we knew, all of us started out learning a song. 
I learned a Yardbird song. I think it was For Your Love, one of the first songs I ever learned. Okay? and But I had been singing since Elvis put out Love Me Tender. That's a long time ago. I guess I'm dating myself, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but that was in 55. I was seven years old when my mom took me out. She said, learn this song, learn this song. I don't know how she knew that I could figure it out, but I copied it at least for a couple of years. And then, then eight years old, I started another band. And when I started a band, I had no idea. But back to the story with Tommy and, and those guys like that. And then, you know, of course, recently, a couple of years ago, we lost George to cancer. And, I, to, of course, Tommy uh, Toy was gone in 92. So uh, his, his heart, uh, lung congestion. But uh, when you put a group like that with nobody with no real music experience, I mean, as good as Toy wrote those songs, those songs were, were basically not his badge of courage. They were everybody's badge of courage. And I, it, it made us to where we were, you know, I'm more than proud today because I can walk in a place in Des Moines, Iowa, and people walk up, man, I love that band. I love that band more than anything. And that's a place where there's not anybody that lives there. You know, there's, there's a few people that live there in Des Moines, you know, 100,000. But uh, then you go into smaller places and people might see the shirt or talk to one of the guys or they see our trucks and buses go down the road and they're going, I haven't heard that band in 25 years. I, I brought my grandkid to see you two, year, two years ago. And, you know, they, they pe- people are still amazed at the band. And I'm truly amazed that people are still interested like yourself. Mm. Uh, and then back in 1983, uh, you had the the reins of the band virtually handed over to to you and Jerry. How do you, and you virtually had to rebuild the band from start. How was how was that experience now looking back on it? Well, creatively enough, it was simple for me uh, to go and find people because I knew the promoters always wanted Marshall Tucker Band to be there. We had been fair with them. We run our own organization, and we made the deals. And so promoters said, yeah, I still want Marshall Tucker Band. But I had to overcome that stigma of not having the rest of the guys in the band because, you know, of course, we had lost a couple of them by then. And I, I Jerry, being my best buddy, he has since retired. He's, I don't even think he's playing anymore. And uh, he's a sax player. And, and so these other guys, you know, I honestly don't see them anymore, which is really, really strange because they moved. Mm-hmm. So, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it was one of the, it was an easy thing to do. But, you know, what I did is I went to Nashville. I said, because of the timing of this, because there was never any arguments. These guys come up and said, man, I just don't want to be out there anymore. You know, it was a di- it was different. It was a different band with Franklin to start with in 1980, uh, 1981, 82, and then Toy decided he wanted to. He said, man, I just think I'm going to take a break for a couple of years, and he did. And uh, uh, then, then we went out there. But what I did and Jerry did is I went to Nashville, and I looked for the best musicians that had that taste and that personality because, you know, it is, I feel as if Marshall Tucker's about all personality instead of, you know, the, the showmanship that a lot of people like to think that we are. Uh, of course, we put on shows we still do and, and we think we're something for a minute and then we turn right around and let's go have a beer and then we're okay, you know, and then we're back to reality again. And uh, I went to Nashville at that point and, and I said you know what would be so interesting is I, I got this guy that handles everybody in the world actually a, a huge company now but uh, he's a drummer he played on Elton John stuff and, and people like that and he said he'd go out with me for a summer and the personality fit and then uh, I got Bob Ray to go out with me who's played on everybody from George Jones to Lou Rawls to uh Ray Charles and uh, Earth, Wind and Fire, I think he did some stuff for, and then some jazz artists, I know he did that, so I wanted that personality too. And then we went over to Bobby Ogden, who had actually played keyboard for Elvis in the latter days. Okay, so I had a group of guys that were friends with each other, and they said, yeah, man, we'll go out for a summer and give it a shot. And then I knew that I could go out, and instead of wow the audience over, I wanted to let them know that I wasn't going to let them down, and this wasn't for, uh, you know, for the 
crap of it. You know, I wasn't going out just to keep a band going. Yeah. And when I did that, and then Jerry left, you know, for eight, ten years ago, and he wanted just to quit for a while, and uh, he quit, and then I don't think, it, like I, as, as I spoke before, I don't think he's playing anymore, but uh, he was in a couple of bands for uh, a while, and, you know, it's been successful. These guys do not want to get back together. They don't want to, they didn't want to do it then, or they wouldn't give it up, and, um, uh, you know, I will say that Marcy Tucker Band has been, if if the truth be known, it had Toy and myself gotten together after that summer. I have two of those guys that work for me now. Not players, but uh, uh, one's my assistant manager out on the road, He's and then the other one's the road manager. And these guys were working for Toy, and I had just called Toy because this this company had come up to us, and they said, if you Toy get together, we will we'll take care of y'all and put this one record out and they wanted us to do acoustic versions of a lot of different songs that we had done some especially some of the country things and uh toy and i had already talked toy was shooting a video for his midnight promises record and uh or the toy call up record that he had done and uh I end up today, believe it or not, I, I close with one of Toy's songs called Midnight Promises that he wrote after he left the band. And d- despite the fact that you, you are now the only original member, I don't think anyone could uh, could accuse you of being the Marshall Tucker Band in name only. It's very much a band that I, I'd feel Tommy and Toy and all the original guys would be proud of. I think you're right, and, yeah. and I appreciate you saying that. I honestly think that you're right, and I did worry about it for a few years, just like I worried about when Toy said you gotta got to learn how to talk to the audience. And uh, Let me finish that story. When I, when I did go out and Toy said that, I bought all these live records. I came home, I listened to them, and I tried them for a couple of weeks, saying certain things, and it just didn't work. And then I came back, and I don't know what it was. I just used my own confidence. I got out there and just said what I felt. Yeah. You know, and you know what? That worked better than anything instead of a bunch of jive. I just went up there and, you know, hey, how y'all doing? And that was it. And then, you know, this broke through, and it's still working today. Now let's talk about this record of yours, Soul of the South. Uh, these are essentially 30-year-old recordings for a solo album that, that never saw the light of day. So I guess the burning question is, why, why didn't it come out at the time? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was asked by a major record label that we won't have to go into to release this. They said, man, we love it. We want you to finish it. It wasn't about any one particular song. It's just that we want you. We like the way you sing this stuff. It was 80s sounding, and it sounded as if uh, it could work. I had no idea that they would like it, but I had picked these songs and recorded the, the stuff, and then when they offered me the money, then I realized I still was obligated to the guys you know, the Marshall Tucker Band. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, well, I've, they gave me two weeks to think about it, and then I realized that we had to do another Marshall Tucker record for Warner Brothers. And so we went and done two more records for Warner Brothers. I put the stuff in the can, and I turned them down and the money. Mm. Was it a, a, tough, and, a tough decision to make? Absolutely not. Yeah. And I don't regret it a minute because at least I got it out now yep. without having to go out there and try it on my own because honestly I don't think it would have made it on its own you know I know it's a good record and uh, it's it's a very good mixed up CD but it it is just for my fun is all it was cut for it was actually cut because I was bored and we were taking less we were taking more time off because we had been working 300 days a year we were down to working 250 and you know here i was a guy that's so active and go out and see bands all the time i actually accept uh, uh, material from bands all the time on lots of publishing companies and uh, put out other records and stuff for other people and kind of stay in the background but it's it's more important to me to uh, let people know that you, you've got a record, do it for your heart. And then if people like it, that's good. But you've got to make decision between your buddies that you're sitting there playing with. For heaven's sake, don't go out on your own. I mean, let's, let's look at Phil Collins. He'd be great because he was that guy, mm-hmm. okay? But also at the same time, I, didn't have, I don't have enough confidence to do that on my own. Would I recut another record today like that? I don't think I could, and I probably would 
never sing any of those songs live except for one song and that's Sandman because it's got Toy's guitar on it yeah. and it's got one of one of the Muscle Shoals uh guys. I mean some of the songs, you know, was written by Michael Bolton before he ever had a record deal. That's right, yes. Yeah. You know? So that's freaky right there in itself. So ever since <laughs> I was picking songs, you know. Maybe I should have been a A and R guy, which is basically what I am today. I mean, I'm I'm an entertainer, but at the same time, I own a record company, which is Rambling, and you know, a distribution Sony, and we just keep putting records out, man. It's all, it is. I, I sound like a businessman on one hand, but the other part of the brain saying, you know, I did this for the right reasons. I didn't do it for the. I, I didn't ever start this band because I thought I was a damn genius, okay? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> never did. No, we never started this band. We didn't go out. We started, as I spoke, the first thing I said to you, we started it because we wanted enough beer for the weekend. And that is the true story. And I remember many times sneaking it out in that big drum pedal, that bass drum, sneaking the liquor out of those private parties that we played for. Many times all of us did that and had a great time afterwards, you know. Of course, we saw the moon many days. <laughs> ah. Now, the, the, the Soul of the South, it's a, a diversion away from the musical direction and sound that we'd know you for, and it really shows an, another side to yourself. Is, was that something you were really keen to do? You know what? I really wasn't aware of. Uh, I wanted to do soulful music. I used to sneak in to see James Brown. Okay, I was like 11 years old. I'd be the only white guy going in to see James Brown. Hence, it changed later, you know. But uh, it was as we went forward in life and our whole respective characters down in the South and across the country, I, you know, it was accepted. But I was always accepted. Sam and Dave, uh, all these other soulful artists, Dion Warwick would come through. And I'd go see those shows. Everybody knew me as, as the only white guy had come to those shows at that period of time. But mom and dad, they didn't get, they didn't really give a rats, whatever. But uh, they, you know, they wanted me to go. They wanted me to go have a good time, and I learned so much. A, a person named Jerry Butler, who's in Sam Cook, came through Spartanburg, and I got to see Sam, and I went, holy. Jesus, you know, that's a guy. And all I wanted to do was have songs that were emotionally uprising. That's That song that's on there, Still Thinking of You Off the Soul of the South, is if you don't get a cold chill through that song and you're sitting there with half a beer or maybe a six-pack of beer or whatever shot you want to take, if that song don't make you think of an old flame, I'll come down there and take care of it, you know? <laughs> I'll show you. I'll, I'll, I'll pay the tab. But it does do that. Every one of those songs has a meaning. Never enough of your love. You know, I mean, they, they were there. You know, mm. ain't nobody's fool, stuff like that. These were songs that uh, that just really mattered to me. And I had great players play on them. You know, I had the original band, plus without Minus Tommy, excuse me, and then Minus Tommy, and then uh, I went to Nashville, and these guys said, hey, man, I really want to put this down. And I had all these characters coming to a studio. I don't know. I guess I'm a magnet, and that's why um, um, musicians still come and see our shows today. You'll see them stand out there with their band shirt on, and they're sitting there listening, and I get an email from them, and they say, man, you know, I never realized that you guys, but I always knew that you could play some jazz, but y'all went way off. And, you know, jamming was what we did. We got, we got what, 25-minute versions of the songs that actually are edited versions that you guys get to hear later in life, you know? Mm. And people, these engineers tell me, hey, why don't we cut it? We can really fit this in good on the CD. I said, no, you can't take the life out of something, and it was the life. Now, there's also a, a new Greatest Hits package out there for this 40th anniversary. And considering there's been, it's not the first Greatest Hits package you've put out, what was the criteria that you used in selecting the tracks for this one? Well, uh, it was a beautiful thing. I, for the last, well, that record's been pulled off the shelves for probably eight, ten years. And the reason we pulled it off is because a lot of people said it didn't have their particular favorite Greatest Hits on there greatest hit song and I said well you know what's it gonna take and so I added up with all these different people and we had great conversations and I said what would be your favorite greatest hits 
song that would be on a record so you wouldn't have to change your CD. And out of those, we added five new songs and had the original greatest hits. I had the ability to add five new songs on there that now, and it's showing and it's, uh, it's, it's feeling because people that are really fans go there and say they got their, their hit on it. You know, the greatest hit. So it, it, it really, that's why I did what I did with those particular songs. Songs like In My Own Way. And, uh, you know, 24 hours at a time, you know, those weren't greatest hits at the time, but they are the songs that people like to hear live. Mm -hmm. And that's what made me do that particular way. And just before I let you go, Doug, what what else is coming up in your upcoming plans? Any special uh, events coming up for the 40th anniversary? Well, I got to tell you, we just finished recording It's Tricky by Run DMC. Oh, really? And I know, yeah, and, and you can compare the two. It won't be out. It's in a movie called Angel Camouflage, and it has not been uh, signed. The papers have not been signed yet, and I think it's uh, going to be signed here within the next few weeks. But the, the uh, soundtrack has already been finished, and it's not anything but us and Fire on the Mountain. We're doing that on there. And then Curtis Blow is doing some stuff on there, and then a girl name uh, from South Africa, her name is Delana, and uh, that's the name she goes by. And she actually is in the star in the movie. But not to give anything away, it is. Uh, it was truly when they called me up and said, you want to do these two songs? And I said, well, are we in the movie? So we're actually in the movie. I have a little a bit of a speaking part. And it's like, hey, you remember that song we learned at your brother's birthday party? And we did it. And, uh, and we turn around and we're in this pub somewhere down in the uh, lower part of South Carolina or Georgia. And they rebuilt this thing. It just, it's a long, long, long drawn out story. And uh, uh, it's really good movie. And uh, if anybody wanted to see it, they could go to the download of uh, the, the uh, trailer, which is uh, called Angel Camouflage. And, uh, you know, it's it's pretty cool. That's one thing that's coming on. And then, you know, we just got back from performing for the troops over in uh, Kuwait and Iraq. And that was neat. And uh, I think we'll be going back. I'm not sure exactly when or where, but they have asked us to come back, and we'll go back over there and do that. And uh, as long as time allows us to do whatever. And I have one more, uh, one more, another live DVD coming out next year. So that'll be cool. Fantastic. Plenty to look forward to. Certainly. Fantastic. Doug, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute honour to, to catch up with you on, on this year, the 40th anniversary of uh, a much-loved band, the Marshall Tucker Band. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Okay. Let's hope we, we might get you down to Australia sometime. That'd be great to see you here. Anytime I can come, you just make me a spot, okay? Okay. We'll be waiting. <laughs> right, thanks. Thanks, Doug. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.